Good morning, Carbini. It's RJ back with another video. So let's get to it. Today's random Mike Schmidt item of the day. Very random. A 1982 Fleer Mike Schmidt card. 1982. Why 1982 today? Uh, it was lying around, grabbed it, and it made me think of uh, pictures we took of ourselves that we wish we never had. Um, we don't normally think of Mike with a full beard. I'm trying to sneeze here. <laughs> Oh, excuse me for that. Um, we don't really think of Mike Schmidt <coughs> having a full beard, but he did in a couple various images, this one being one of them. Uh, I don't ever think of Mike with a beard, uh, but this is one of those pictures you look at and go, why? But uh, he chose to wear a beard that season. You know, just a random card to show off. Today's random baseball item of the day, same thing. I was looking through old cards, and I found these two gems. Cards we thought were going to be worth a ton of money someday in our, in our past. 1992 Manny Ramirez rookie cards. One from Tops, one from Score. Uh, I'm sure back in the uh, late 2000s, while Manny was uh, still very productive, even though he began some uh, steroid scandal incidents, I'm sure we all thought he was going to be all that in a bag of chips, but unfortunately, these were two of the most overproduced sets ever made, ever known to man. 1991 and 1992 are without a doubt the most overly produced card sets that ever came out of card production, and Manny's rookie card fell in there. I don't think these two even graded in a PSA 10 would garner more than 10 bucks, uh, but it's a nice thing to show off as a random item today. So today's trivia question. The 1962 Mets are widely considered one of the worst baseball clubs in the world. Uh, they won a total of 40 games and lost uh, over 120. So the question I have for you is, believe it or not, in that monstrosity, there was actually a pitcher who had a winning record. Who is the only pitcher from the 1962 Mets to finish his season with a winning record. Um, what you're playing for, two star cards from the 80s. Uh, this is from, what is it, uh, 1984, the Al Oliver Drake's Cakes cards. Awesome little card of Al Oliver, who I believe should be in the Hall of Fame. I know there are a lot of people out there who feel the same way. He is dang near 3,000 hits for his career and was without a doubt one of the best hitters of all time. And uh, from 1990, 1989, excuse me, the Ames 2020 Club Bo Jackson card. Everybody needs a good Bo Jackson card in their collection. So these two cards could be yours if you can answer that question. Please send me an email with the correct answer. I will include my email in the description below. Along with the repeat of that question, you will have today and tomorrow to answer. We'll pick a winner on Sunday, all right? Good luck to everybody on that. Today, what I want to talk about is a um, forgotten Hall of Famer. I love doing these. Uh, sometimes I get time to do them, sometimes I don't. Today, I'm going to get back in the swing and introduce everybody to a forgotten Hall of Fame member. This one happens to be a member of the Negro Leagues, a man named Willie Wells. I'll hold up his Hall of Fame plaque postcard here so you can read a little bit about them. Uh, I'm about to go through a long biography of Willie Wells, so I hope you don't mind this. Uh, but here for your enjoyment is a little bit of information on Willie Wells, today's Forgotten Hall of Famer. Hang on. Willie James Wells was born on August the 10th, 1906, in the Texas state capital of Austin. He lived with his parents and four brothers. Baseball was his passion, as it was for many young boys in rural America, and he would often travel to nearby Dobbs Field to watch various semi-pro and black baseball teams from the area, teams he would eventually join in his mid to late teens. During those years, he began playing with the semi-pro Austin Black Senators, 
playing against traveling Negro League teams. He played briefly with the San Antonio Black Aces and the Houston Buffaloes. His reputation garnered interest from Rube Foster, then with the Chicago American Giants, and Dr. George Keyes, owner of the St. Louis Stars. He chose to sign with the Stars and began his career in Negro League ball in 1924. Being five foot nine, he was primarily a shortstop, but as did many Negro League stars, he played most positions at one time or another in his career. But unlike other shortstops, he hit with power, reaching 20 or more home runs five times in his career. During his eight year term with the St. Louis Stars, he won the Negro National League Championship three times. Rube Foster's original Negro National League collapsed following the 1931 season, and the Stars went out with them. Wells split time in 1932 between the Detroit Wolves and the Homestead Grays of the East-West League before joining the newly formed Negro National League version 2 and the newly formed Chicago American Giants of that circuit. In three years with the Giants, Wells was an all-star each year. Like many Negro League stars, Wells played winter ball in the Caribbean and Mexico, where they were treated with the adulation and respect they could not find in America. It was during his time in Mexico that he acquired his nickname, El Diablo, the Devil, due to his aggressive and fearless play at his position. Hall of Famer Monty Irvin is quoted as saying, you should have seen Willie Wells play shortstop, as good as Ozzie Smith and a better hitter. Willie joined the Newark Eagles in 1936 as the Giants experienced financial difficulties. He played for the Eagles on and off through 1945, heading to Mexico when relations got strained between him and the owners at Newark. But he was able to spend the full season of 1942 as player-manager in Newark. He was selected to come Posey's annual All-American Dream Team, being identified as one of the top five players in the game when discussing prospects qualified for Major League service. After eight games in Newark in 1945, Willie joined the New York Black Yankees and began a bit of a nomadic period, playing for the Baltimore Elite Giants, Indianapolis Clowns, and Memphis Red Sox through 1948. In 1946, Jackie Robinson signed to play with the Montreal Royals. While with New York, it is widely reported that Wells was asked by Branch Rickey to coach Robinson in Montreal to tutor him in the art of making the pivot. In the early 1950s, Wells traveled to Canada to assume the duties as playing manager with the Winnipeg Buffaloes, spending most of his final year involved with baseball up north. Upon finally ending his playing career, he had acquired a 330 career batting average, 392 against major league competition, and was widely regarded as the best shortstop to ever have played Negro League ball. After retiring from baseball, Wells worked in a New York City restaurant until 1973 when he returned home to Austin to care for his aging mother. After she passed, he remained in his childhood home until his death in 1989. He was buried in Texas State Cemetery in Austin, where his headstone includes his nickname of El Diablo. He was elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1997 and is also so enshrined in Mexico and Cuba. So that was a little bit of information about Willie Wells. Um, The uh, information came from a number of sources, so if there's anything somebody believes is wrong, uh, it's this fault of the sources, not me, and I apologize for it, but uh, I did find most of that information from a number of different sources, so I trust that it's accurate. Uh, I personally have three cards of Willie Wells. I showed already the postcard. There was a card set of Negro League players produced by the Larry Fritch Cards Company back in 1986. Negro League Baseball Stars. This is the Willie Wells card from that set. And then back in 2020, the uh, 100th anniversary of the Modern Negro Leagues put out a set. This is Willie Wells' card from that one. So those are the three cards I have. One of the things I like about Willie Wells is in 2006, Major League Baseball 
really tried to um, um, make up for what they considered past injustices and inducted a large amount of Negro League players. Um, there was a lot of talk at the time that they went overboard. Um, you can debate that all you want. I know that in that class there were several well-deserving players. Uh, I shan't uh, cast aspersions on any of the people who went in there, but Willie Wells went in uh, almost a decade before that cleansing. So Willie Wells was very much a deserving player, no matter what you think of that class from 2006. Uh, again, one of the um, pro most well-respected, um, most, um, I don't know what they, showered upon greatness, I don't know, you know, one of the most lauded Negro League stars that ever was because of his incredible play at the shortstop position. Regularly a 300 hitter, had some pop in his early years, um, and uh, just played forever and had a great, great impact on, on Negro League baseball. So, uh, Willie Wells is your forgotten Hall of Famer today. I hope you guys learned a little bit about the man and uh, learned to appreciate everything about him. Uh, hope it inspires you to learn a little bit more about some of the other forgotten Hall of Famers, not just Negro Leagues, not just Major League players, but also the executives or like that. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please consider like, subscribing, commenting, and all that jazz. I really do appreciate it. Um, I try my best sport, you guys, uh, so, um, we can all, I know we all enjoy this hobby, so let's try and support each other. Uh, I got one more video for you on Friday, so stop back for that. I hope you enjoyed that. Please consider like, subscribe, commenting, all that jazz. Thank you much. Hope to see you again on Friday and Sunday for the recap, all right? Thanks for watching. Take care.